We'll call the um, Thursday, June 4th meeting of the <coughs> Capitola Planning Commission to order. Roll call, please. Commissioner Welch? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Chairperson Smith? Here. If you'd both please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. There are some handouts that we distributed and have in the back of the room, including um, an errata sheet for item 5C, the uh, Knob Hill project at 809 Bay Avenue. Thank you. Um, this is the time for public comments. Um, these are for communications from the public that are not included on our agenda this evening. Um, all speakers are requested to print your name when you approach the podium and please do um, speak into the microphone so that folks can hear you at home. And um, the um, amount of time allowed for each comment is three minutes. So if there's anyone here who'd like to speak on an item not on tonight's agenda, please come forward. Uh, hello, members of the commission. My name is Doug Bowman. I live on Orchid Avenue. and. Eventually, you're going to be looking into the proposed skate park at Monterey Avenue. And I, w I just would like to urge you to consider the, the neighborhood, the, the fact that 95% of the neighbors are adjacent to that park, do not want it there, and consider scaling it back to the original thing we were talking about, like a 2,000-foot skate park for the little kids and families and stuff, and leave the the bigger kids can go to the McGregor skate park. I'm you know, the McGregor skate park that's already in progress, and you know, I don't see the need for two big skate parks a thousand yards apart. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on an item not on tonight's <coughs> agenda? Uh, good evening, Commission members. My name is Richard Lippi. Um, I live on Monterey Avenue, and I have the distinction, dubious distinction, of being the closest neighbor to the proposed uh, skate park, uh, proposed 6,000-foot uh, skate park at Monterey Park. And um, and I'll be brief tonight. Um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, along with uh, many others in the neighborhood, are um, trying to really understand this proposed uh, skate park. We're looking for comparables to figure out what uh, will be the natural effects and maybe the uh, unintended consequences of uh, the skate park. And uh, fortunately, we were given uh, by the promoters of the proposed skate park uh, an example of the Ojai Skate Park in Ojai, California, Ventura County, where they say that a letter from Ojai Superintendent has a skate park right next to their district office and school. And that sounds very encouraging for a comparable. Uh, the superintendent writes that the new skate park is now more than three years old and rests at the far east end of the district office property. So that prompted me to do a little investigation and I find that the Ojai skate park um, is actually uh, widely separated from the district office by a two-story uh, gymnasium. The school that's next door, next door to the uh, skate park is Chaparral High School. It's a continuation high school of 60 students. On the left of the skate park is uh, Valero Gas Station. On the right is the Chevron Gas Station. And the parking, uh, the uh, shopping center is further on down. And across the street, uh, of the business district are uh, commercial enterprises, uh, restaurants, uh, baking companies, and, and that sort of thing. So it's actually in a commercial area, which I think, if it is successful, helps it to be successful. We are in a, a, a heavily neighborhood area of residences, and um, we don't think that this sort of a plan will work, but it does point out that it can work in a commercial area. And the last thing I want to say is that noise is going to be a big uh, concern in this project. And uh, Ojai, California has a really nice noise standard and regulations that uh, help protect residents from unhealthy levels of noise. And I think it's interesting that 
they have here in the noise ordinance, they have nine factors that they weigh as to whether the noise is a nuisance or not. And the sound level of the objectionable noise, which is the decibel level, is just the first one. And there's eight more. So um, the project is going to be very involved. It's going to be very contentious. And uh, we hope to have enough information that um, we can avoid a long conversation. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Mr. Lippi, may I ask you a question? Yes. What is the decibel level in Ojai? What is the decibel? What do they list in their ordinances as oh, the decibel? Oh, yeah, that's, that's good um, because they're very specific about that. In the residential zone, the maximum is 55 decibels from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then in commercial areas from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., it's 65 decibels. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello. My name is Helen Bryce. I just wanted to say that I'm opposed to the proposed skate park um, proposal in Monterey Park um, for reasons of noise that um, Rich Libby just brought up but for many, many other reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on an item not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, um, we'll move to um, commission comments. No. None. Staff comments? Approval of the minutes. I move approval. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye unanimously passed. Um, the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion um, without further discussion unless someone from the public or someone from the commission would like to pull one of those items. Tonight we have two items on the consent calendar. Um, the first is 2185 41st Avenue which is a sign permit for a new awning uh, with sign for a dentist's office in the community commercial zoning district. And um, 3555 Clare Street, Suite TT, a conditional use permit for sale of beer and wine at an existing restaurant, Rudot, in the Community Commercial Zoning District. Is there anyone from the public who would like to um, pull either of these items and have further discussion? Seeing none, are there any? I'd like to make comment? one comment on item 4B. Um, condition number two um, is related to the hours of the operation and days of week and staff would recommend removing condition number two before adopting the consent agenda so they're not tied to specific hours of operation. Thank you. I move approval of the uh, consent calendar with the uh, exclusion of I uh, condition number two in item 4B. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Unanimous. Um, moving on now to public hearings. Um, each of the public hearings are um, designed to give the public an opportunity to speak and be heard. Um, the process that we'll use um, in reviewing each of these items will be a staff presentation. Once the presentation is over, we'll give um, the public an opportunity to, to speak, starting with the applicant themselves, if they, if they would like to do a presentation. Um, after that, we'll bring it back to the commission and um, have our comments. Um, the public speaks before the, the commission takes it on, and then we will reach a decision. So 429 Riverview Avenue, staff so report, before please. Before we start, can I ask a question about conflict of interest? Sure. Um, thank you so much for giving me my little map, which showed uh, the circles. 300 feet and 500 feet. Um, the way this works, the way I understand it, the FPPC says that if a project is within 300 feet of your uh, one of the commissioner's residences, then we need to recuse ourselves because it is presumed that we have a conflict with a project that's so close to us. Um, there's also a 500 foot rule uh, which I believe applies if a uh, uh, commissioner has a financial conflict uh, which means that they own a business or they own a property that's actually uh, a rental that's rented out um, uh, within that area. So um, having watched the council recently, they seem to have adopted the 300-foot rule 
and I understand they're doing that because the FPPC has now said there's some sort of exclusion for small cities like Capitola where really the 300 foot applies, not the 500 foot, unless you have an actual financial conflict. So am I correct? Is that what our city attorney is now telling us? or because I can comment on that. The 300 foot setback um, distance is set based on the fact that we are a smaller city and under 20,000 in population. So that, that's why we can go to the 300 foot. I can look further into the 500 foot regarding um, whether or not you're a business owner. I'd like to bring more clarity to that, to the second half of your question. But the 300 is the limit that we utilize um, based on the size of our city. Because I believe Commissioner Ortiz and I both live within 500 feet of the property, but not 300 well, feet of the property. Well, that's probably the reason why I didn't get a green card on it, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm right. assuming that's probably the reason. Okay, so yeah. we can participate. You can. Thank you. And excuse me one second. Before we go to the presentation, um, I neglected to announce that this meeting is being cablecast live on Charter Communications, cable TV channel 8 and is being recorded to be replayed on Monday and Friday next week on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Um, you can also view the meeting live um, on the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org. Tonight our technician is Renee Sheets and please if you haven't already turned off your cell phone, please turn off your cell phone during the meeting. Thank you. Staff report please. Since I caught it, it doesn't count. <laughs> Okay, good evening Madam Chair and Commissioners. Before you tonight, there's a conditional use permit, design permit and variance for an addition to a historic single family home at 429 Riverview Avenue located in the R1 single family zoning district. It's highlighted in blue in the aerial. Um, on the screen is a photo of the existing home. The structure at 429 Riverview is located within the old Riverview Historic District. The home was built during the settlement period of the district. Um, the character defining features of the historic home at 429 Riverview Avenue include the one and a half story main wing with a distinctive bell cast roof line, simple barge boards with tapered ends, turned finials at the apex and the ends of the gables, board and batten siding, wood siding, two original wood casement windows and French doors. As you see in this image, the home is located along the entrance of the Riverview Walk. Way. On the cover of your application, there is an image as seen on the screen that includes an archway sign to identify the entrance into the walkway. I'd like to clarify that this is um, an offer on the half of the applicant that will go to city council for review for uh, donating an archway, but it is not part of the review this evening and because it's on city property, I'd like to keep that separate from the review tonight. Thank you. The image on the slide is a survey of the lot. Here is the footprint of the building shown in blue. The historic structure does not comply with side yard setback regulations of the zoning code and therefore is a non-conforming structure. To bring the historic home into compliance with setbacks would require removing a portion of the historic home and is contrary to historic preservation. The applicant within this approval is um, going beyond the 80% allotment for a non-conforming structure with the improvements proposed and is requesting a variance for the non-conforming structure requirements within our code. This image shows the addition onto the front of the home towards Riverview Avenue. The new addition is located within 6.5 feet of the front property line and 3 feet of the side property line on the second story. Also, the parking dimensions required by code are 10 feet by 18 feet for sidewalk exempt areas. The applicant is requesting a variance for substandard parking lot parking sizes at eight and a half feet wide rather than the required nine foot wide spots. They do have two spots on site. Um, they're just substandard. So the applicant is requesting a variance for the front and side yard setbacks, parking dimensions, and the non-conforming structure at the 80% threshold. This is an aerial image of the property relative to surrounding properties. As seen in this slide, many of the existing structures do not comply. 
do not comply with the front yard setbacks and likely the on-site parking requirements. The Planning Commission may grant a variance permit when it finds that because of special circumstances applicable to the subject property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, the strict application of this title is found to deprive the subject property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity under the identical zoning classification. And also when they find that the grant of a variance permit would not constitute the grant of special special privileges inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and zone. As indicated in the staff report, staff supports a variance request as a method of preserving the historic home while allowing the homeowner to have additional space, although utilizing area within the setbacks. By allowing the addition into the setbacks, the historic structure is not overwhelmed by the new addition. Uh, now to take a look at the proposed design. The sli this slide includes the south elevation that will face the Riverview pathway. As you can see, the historic portion of the home is maintained with the new addition off of the front of the home. This is the home as viewed from the SoCal Creek. The new addition looks as if it is looming in this 2D image when in fact it is set 40 feet back from the primary facade. As viewed from the river, the historic home will maintain the current one and a half story massing. This is the home as viewed from Riverview Avenue. You can see the open covered parking under the new addition. The floor of the second story is eight and a half feet above grade. This will keep the new living space out of the floodplain while maintaining the scale of the streetscape. This slide includes the north elevation as viewed from the neighboring residence. In this slide, you can see how the introduction of the new exterior materials differentiates the historic from the new. Oh. Um, I'm sorry, that was this slide. This is the first story floor plan of the home. The owner will enter through the gate that leads to the central courtyard depicted in tan on the screen. The homeowner can enter the home off the courtyard through three different entrances as shown on the slide. One entrance leads to the second story through a set of stairs. The second entrance leads into the master bedroom on the main floor and the third into the common area near the kitchen. This is the second story. The internal staircases lead to the bunk room. The exterior staircase provides an alternative to walking through the bunk room to access the other two bedrooms and two bathrooms. The applicant submitted a historic background and description and an assessment of compliance with the Secretary of Interior Standards by historian Kent L. Seavey. At the time of submittal, staff sent the plans and Mr. Seavey's report out for third-party technical review by architectural historian Leslie Dill. Ms. Dill did not agree with Mr. Seavey's findings um, for the original review and identified standards that were not in compliance under the original design. Home designer Derek Van Alstein worked with Ms. Dill, Ms. Dill to address her design concerns. On March 26, 2015, Ms. Dill made findings of compliance with the Secretary of Interior Standards as conditioned. Also, staff would like to request an additional condition be added to the permit if granted. During the Arkin site review, the Public Works Department requested that sheet E1 be updated to reflect stormwater permit project applications. Um, due to the designer being out of town, um, this change was unable to be made in the, before the um, packet went out, so we're requesting to add a condition of approval that this be done prior to building permit. Staff recommends approval of the application 13179 with the additional condition of approval for stormwater. Thank you. Questions of staff? I have one question. Can you go back to the elevation which um, shows the, the proposed from Riverview Avenue? Okay. Thank you. Okay, if there are no questions um, of staff, this is the time for public comment. The, the applicant is here. My name is Derek Van Alstein. I am the applicant and 
I represent the Rudens who would have loved to have been here. They had a family emergency and were unable to be here. Um, I know they wanted to very much. Um, <coughs> this, uh, this project goes back quite a ways for us. Uh, we spent uh, a good portion of a year on it before we applied in 2013. Uh, it's now been another year and a half to deal with all of the issues. It's a very difficult project being it's not just in the flood plain, it's in the flood way. Um, so the, uh, the restrictions that are put on it are, are fairly severe. And then having it being, it is for the most part a single wall structure that's there now. Um, part of it's been uh, rebuilt after the earthquake. The chimney came down and the interior of the living space was rebuilt and it was studded at that point. So it has stud walls in, in a portion of it. We think we can stud wall the rest of it and then be able to lift it in order to fix the foundation. It's a difficult task um, for a lot of different reasons. So a very challenging project. Um, there was disagreement amongst the historians as to what worked and what didn't work. Um, <coughs> and there was also my disagreement with what they thought originally. <laughs> So what we've come up with is something that I think that we could all agree on. Um, <coughs> it's <coughs> there with any of these projects, there are compromises. <coughs> there are some compromises that um, we made that had to be made in order to get it out of the floodway um <coughs> and to relieve the old structure from the presence of the new structure. And what was finally decided was that the best way to facilitate that was to build the new portion of the structure towards the street so that the remaining portion of it wasn't impacted from the river and from the, and from the river walk, which, we f which everyone felt was actually more important than the street. Um, it's somewhat blocked, as you can see from the street here and that the little projection that you can see on the second floor actually was a is a contemporary adi addition it was done in the 60s um, the the window that you see upstairs to just to the left of that s small uh, portion of the second floor um, is one of the few windows left from the original house um, that's getting <coughs> moved down to the kitchen wherever we can save pieces of it we're, we are saving pieces of it a majority of this house is now plywood siding and aluminum windows. Um, <coughs> it is, however, considered a contribut contributor to a national district, which is which holds court. Um, it it holds sway over just about everything. So, being that it's considered as a contributor to this historic district, we want to save as much of the of the flavor of it as we can, and I think we're uh, we. I think we will achieve that. I think it actually will go back closer to where it was originally than it is now. Um, <coughs> the the little round window that you see over the French doors and the French doors below that are original and, the, and that one window upstairs is original. They're all staying as is the board and bat siding on that wall and it's one of the few places where the board and bat siding is left. Um, but we will then take this plywood off and <coughs> reskin it with board and bat siding on the whole original portion. So what will, what will be left will be, or what we will present will be something fairly close to what it was originally and in its original shape, which is, the, which is considered the contributing factor. The bell cast curve to the roof, the, the somewhat quirky uh, barge rafters and, and decorations. Um, which make it fun. It's it's a little bit whimsical, and it'll stay that way. Um, the new portion then will be be able to be clearly recognized as a new portion, and will be different um, than the old portion. And that was something that we worked on quite a bit. It, this has been this has gone through quite a few revisions to get it to the place where it is now. So that being said, um, there is there's one thing I'd like to co correct in the in the body uh, of the staff report, and that is that it's called out as 1,762 existing square feet. It's not. It's 1,156 square foot feet, and the addition is 606 square feet, bringing the total to 1,762 square feet. 
<coughs> so if you look on, well, what I have is page 46 under conditions at the bottom where it says consists of a construction of 660, 606 square foot addition to a 1,764 square foot single family home. Should read to an 1,156 square foot home. So the total is 1,750. So with that, I'll, I urge you to <coughs> approve the project. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Questions of the applicant? Questions. So it, you mentioned keeping the board and bat on the front elevation. Mm -hmm. I'm noticing that the drawing, the actual rendering, is a uh, is uh, shingle, and on the plans it's shingle. The oh, w w what I was referring to was on the front elevation of the existing house. So specifically, the shingles were uh, were placed on the addition to differentiate that from the I existing right. house. Right. Okay. So a so actually, from the street, I guess at an angle you'd still be able to see the original house, but not directly on. That's correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions of the applicant? Uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask my question now. Um, on the stairway that goes up to the bedrooms off the patio, mm -hmm. um, I had concerns about that stairway going up because you're going to have to have two exterior doors within the house because basically you've, you've created a, another entrance there. Okay. And um, uh, I don't know if I heard this correctly or not, but part of the reasoning for doing that had to do with floor area ratios or? No, primarily it had to do with having the, the upstairs, one of the upstairs bedrooms, what we call the bunk room, not be a walk-through room. Um, and this was to relieve that situation so that they could use the outside stairway in lieu of going through the bunk room. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I've been in, you know, this business so long. To me, what you're building is a second unit because you have an exterior stairway coming in, an exterior door. You have two bedrooms. I even see a place that you could put the kitchen and the bathroom. You know, you've got the bathroom there. So that becomes a real concern to me. And so if I can't convince my other commissioners to, you know, remove that stairway because if you did, you know, the t bathroom could shift over. They could butt against each other which seems like, you know, construction-wise is a good thing, and you would actually gain the square footage that you're using for the stairway, which you could put into the bunk room to make it a little bit bigger so you could have a wall to go across the bunk room. The, I think preferably if you'd like to condition it, you know, if, if the commission would like to com condition it, that there be a, a, a deed restriction on the back so that that could not be turned into another unit, I think that would be the preferable way to go. That stairway as it is now is not counted as FA in the FAR as, because it's an exterior stairway. And um, so we wouldn't gain any square footage by doing that. Well, I guess what I'm saying is you would gain square footage with inside your second story if you don't have that stairway there and you don't have a landing that's got two exterior doors on either side of the landing. I mean, it would become right. much more of a sort of a normal house not having those two exterior doors there. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that design-wise it would give you a bit more space in the bunk room. So if you say, well, you know, we're losing a bit of space, closing off the bunk room a bit more so uh, it doesn't seem so much like people are walking through that room. Um, more, more to the point, uh, if, it, if, it, if it becomes the commission's pleasure, the, it would be better to just remove the stairway and connect the 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 bunk room with the rear uh, without those doorways and just wall it in. Right. Um, I would prefer to see that done um, uh, as a condition and and have it acceptable to the yeah. planning director, wh however you would like to condition it. But um, I would prefer not to move the stairwell, of course. Yeah. 
Uh, so as long as you're you're up there and we're discussing things like this, I wonder if the um, the applicant would mind enclosing the garbage in the garage, just putting a little um, wall or a little pony wall or something, so that because since the garage has to be open due to flood waters, right. people from the um, people might be able to see it, neighbors or whatever. And sure, and I, I, uh, that would be fine. Okay, I, we can I, add. I, I think we have, we'll find a way to do okay. that. Yeah, I figured you could. Okay, thank you. So I'm having a little trouble figuring out the parking here. Yeah. Existing, there are so, sort of three spaces. Sort of three of, spaces. Yeah. Sort of three small spaces in front of the house, and your proposal is for two covered spaces, the garage. There are two covered spaces plus the third, which actually they have a Nissan Leaf which fits in that third space, and that's the, uh, so they will have a, pl a plug-in for their for their. That's a very small car. Is that a covered uh, space also? The third space. Yes. But they're all eight and a half feet wide. No, the 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 uh, the EV space is is not even designated here, but it, it's shown on the plot plan. It's the space in front of the gate. 8.5 by 18 covered to double covered garage is you think that's workable? Absolutely. Do you know what a standard car is these these days? If you take a Mercedes uh, 250 SL, it's uh, 15 feet. Yeah. Uh, the days of Cadillacs are long gone. How about uh, F-150s? Uh, F-150s <laughs> are going to 16 and a half, 17 feet. Well, I'd like to see two F-150s in there. Okay. It'd be difficult. <laughs> I wasn't too concerned about the 18 feet because you do have a few feet before you get to the street. So even if a car sticks out a little bit, it's not going to it's be the like the driveways up on Riverview Terrace where it sticks out onto the sidewalk. If it's if yeah, but it's the width that makes it pretty. I mean, probably will only end up being used by one car in many cases. Well, and uh, I. I I think actually you can easily fit two cars in there, and the reason is that the the side walls are not enclosed. Um, if the side walls were enclosed, I would tend to agree with you, but it, it, not being enclosed, it, it helps a lot. I understand this is a narrow lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Another comment at the second story windows are mm -hmm. any of them uh, frosted? Not currently, no. Okay. The one on the front elevation is indicated that it's got these cross hatches over it. I believe it's your bathroom window on this front. That one right there. That's um, yeah, that's in the upstairs bedroom. So I mean, not on the plan. It looks like something's happening there. Yeah, so it's a it's a diamond pattern uh -huh. in that window. It just to just to have it as a feature window. So it's not really a, a diamond pattern window, it's a it's a clear glass window. No, it's a it, it, it does have a diamond pattern. Oh it does have a diamond. Yeah. Okay. And all all the windows will be will be wood windows. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you, Derek. You're welcome. Um, is there anyone here from the public that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for additional comments and discussion. Can someone on the commission help me with condition four and tell me what a no-rise study is? That is a FEMA floodplain regulation. It's required to show that by adding um, new square footage in a flood way that you wouldn't create a rise in the flood elevation. Oh, okay. Other comments? Gail, you want to go first? Well, I do share your concerns about the stairs. I thought about that. And um, I'd just like to have a discussion about uh, the, the pros and cons of asking them to leave it off versus putting a, a something in the deed of trust and you know the pros and cons of those two could staff <coughs> that personally I'm not a big fan of conditioning projects to comply with the municipal code if they added a second unit uh, it wouldn't be permitted it would be illegal I don't know what extra benefit a deed restriction would have we could still enforce without it um, I think if the commission is concerned of that converting to a second unit probably the best approach is 
to eliminate that, that stairwell. I can also add that if the stairwell is removed because it does not count towards the, um, the floor area ratio, if you did not want to make any modifications to how it's proposed at the exterior walls or moving any area around, that you should probably consider um, an exception to the floor area ratio because it's right at the maximum floor area ratio. So if you want the design to stay the same but take out the staircase, but as uh, Commissioner Westman was suggesting, moving things around internally, that would require a um, part of a variance for the floor area ratio. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I brought it up. I'd much rather see the variance for the floor area ratio. Um, I think they've they've done a nice job dealing with the historic structure. I mean, the main view of it that you see in most of the photographs in Capitola is from the river, um, and there are a number of old photographs that show this house here. Um, since they have to comply with the Secretary of Interior standards, which personally I don't always agree with, of having the new addition look completely different from from the existing house, um, but you know it, it, they have to do that, and that's one of the requirements. And uh, I think they've done a nice job with the addition and adding the space. And um, I, I don't have any problems with the parking variance, as I said. Um, you know, there is some space between where the carport ends before you get to the street, so the link's not a problem for me. And uh, as uh, Mr. Van Alstein mentioned, not having walls, and if, if, if this was an enclosed garage, it would be difficult because you couldn't open your garage doors this way. Car uh, doors. Hmm? Your car doors. Your car. You couldn't open your car doors. Yeah, you couldn't open your car <laughs> doors. Uh, so, um, so I don't have any problem with that. My one issue really was that, um, you know, having been in Capitola for a long time, I see properties turn over and people have the best of intentions. And, uh, you know, th this looks like a second unit, easily can be a second unit. If I was buying a new property and I'm coming in and buying it, I would think, oh, well, it's already got an exterior door, an exterior stairway, I can just make it a second unit. And I think in this neighborhood in particular, where parking and a lot of other issues are a problem, I would like to see the stairway go and us grant an exception for those. I think we're talking about 40 or 50 additional square feet so that uh, the design can stay the same. I wouldn't want them to have to go back and, and do a lot of design changes, but that would be my choice if I got it. Well, quite frankly, I'm I'm more empathetic to uh, spending years of uh, the family trying to get this thing to a point where we have agreement. I think it's great that we have um, some type of consensus between the, the different historians. I also am not a strong um, um, proponent of the uh, Secretary of Interior standards, and and so I think if we've come to this far with it, I think it's a great deal. I, and then in addition, on top of that, I don't share the concern about the staircase. I, I think when we start making assumptions of something that may happen, and uh, it is an illegal, uh, sec it would be an illegal second unit, I hate to hold people uh, hostage to something that is a potential that could happen. And, and uh, you know, I just commend them for getting to the point where it's at, and I think it's a good project. Good. Oh, I, I tend to agree on the uh, second unit issue. I'm kind of in my own mind as to how strongly I want to fight against people converting parts of their house to a second unit in terms of the housing supply and the, the issues of, of living in the village here. And, you know, it's potentially a parking issue, but then if you have another family member in there, they may have a car too, so maybe it doesn't change the parking. And then what's the harm? And there's good in that there are more, there's more housing stock. So you know, I, I guess I, I would say uh, there's no, there's there's an ordinance against using this as a second unit, and I'm comfortable just relying on that rather than trying to build in protections. As far as the historic, we're on the cusp of a new zoning code, and I think the historic element is going to be changing quite a bit here. 
So there are, this, this is pointing up why we need to do that. <laughs> Although not probably in this district. Not in this. Oh, it's not in this these district. Okay. In this so district. You know, anyway, but they went through it. They, they, they've uh, made it through that over, over a couple of years now, and uh, congratulate them. And uh, glad to see this project moving forward. <coughs> So I have questions um, that I'm going to have to ask now because I hate being in this position. <laughs> um, if this house were not in the historic district, if it were someplace else, um, would it have enough square footage um, to have an additional unit? No, there's, um, there's 3,096 square feet on the property, so you need to have 5,000 square feet in order to have a second unit. Okay, so it would be clearly an illegal um, additional unit. And I know we've seen those in the village, but the only time we really have any opportunity to find them is when um, there's a remodel. Is that, is that kind of our enforcement on that item at this point? You know, most often we hear from neighbors that will observe, you know, somebody else coming in and out regularly that appears to be living there. Potentially they try to add a new address. We'll find out that way. What would our recourse be if we got a call from a neighbor that said, hey, they've, they've added a... Well, like any code enforcement case, we'd investigate, verify whether or not the allegation were true, and if so, we would uh, require them to cease and desist uh, using that as a second unit. Of course, if somebody was living there, we'd try to be reasonable not to displace somebody unfairly, give them some time, but um, you know, given the situation that it wouldn't be permissible, at least under today's standards, we would just simply require them to cease the use. Is this property in a vacation rental zone? It is, it is just, it's right on the cusp. Um, Pull it up. The blue it house goes to blue the street, gum. The Ron next to mm -hmm. Mr. Graves' house is a vacation rental. So here's the map. I think it's right outside of it. Outside. You can see the pathway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they could not do vacation rentals? No. Okay. okay. Um, I don't really share the concern about it being a second unit only because I live in a home where a second story staircase for the my own enjoyment of my house really became you know a necessary item um, since we are a beach community and you have families that have you know kids that are going to be coming and going having to pass through one of the bedrooms to get to the other bedrooms is in my mind a hardship for just the the enjoyment of the home for the people that live there um, so I have a hard time requiring that they remove the staircase. In looking at the floor plan, it's not, I mean, it would be an awfully tiny kitchen if they decided to turn it into a, mm -hmm. a second unit. Um, so I don't really have a problem with that piece of it. From the historical perspective, though, I think you've, you've done a really good job of coming to a compromise and, and preserving um, a historic view than a historic, you know, look and feel that we really want, especially in that district. Um, so I would like to entertain a motion on this item if someone's willing to make one. So it sounds to me as though we don't have a council or a, a planning commission majority to change the plans, and as long as Commissioner Westman is okay with I'm that, fine. I'll make a motion to uh, to approve the application with the change uh, in um, conditions uh, for a storm for the stormwater and changing condition number one square footage. And I don't think we need to write a condition in um, for the well. We could write a condition in for the garbage enclosure if we mm -hmm. wanted to. Um, I don't think they have a problem with that. It's not a big deal. So I, I would prefer that. Any other? Am I forgetting something? That's my motion. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, shall we do a roll call vote? No, I'm fine. All in favor? Aye. 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 
None opposed. Unanimously passed. Nice Good luck. Thank you. Applicants. They did a great. You did a great job for them. <laughs> they did a great job. You did a great job. They all did a great, great job. job. <laughs> this was a great job. There you Can't go. Wait to see it, man. I'm so happy we're getting these kind of. Things. Next item is 160141st Avenue, a design permit and conditional use permit for expansion of a nursery, exterior remodel, permanent and seasonal outdoor displays, and a height exception for a 16-foot high fence for Orchard Supply Hardware in the Community Commercial Zoning District. Staff report, please. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on your desk this evening, there were modifications that were submitted by the applicant. I also sent out an email previously earlier today. And the change to the plans are on the back table with um, a red highlight around any the modifications that were made for the public to review. Um, okay, so at 1601 41st Avenue, um, the applicant has applied for a design permit and a conditional use permit for a 744 square foot expansion of the nursery, an exterior remodel, and seasonal and permanent outdoor display areas for the existing Orchard Supply hardware store. The applicant also included new signs for the main entrance and the entrance over the nursery. This is the site plan for the expansion. The area in blue is the nursery. The applicant is proposing to expand the nursery by 744 square feet. The applicant is also requesting approval of two permanent outdoor display areas on either side of the entryway shown here in dark blue. This is one of the modifications previously. That area extended in front of the C's candy and the ice cream store. Um, the applicant shortened those to only be in front of the orchard supply. A seasonal outdoor display area is proposed in the center of the parking lot for the, months, for the month of December and also 30 days in early spring. That area will displace 12 parking spots as well as a cart collection area within the parking lot. The applicant added a three foot high wall on the front facade for an area to, sh um, to store shopping carts to the left of the entrance. The permanent outdoor displays and the seasonal outdoor displays are part of the conditional use permit for the retail use. When reviewing a conditional use permit, the Planning Commission may add conditions to the permit to mitigate in any impacts of the proposed use. Within the staff report, conditions 2 through 11 were added to mitigate future impacts from the temporary and seasonal display areas and ensure that the areas are maintained over time. This slide shows the existing hardware store elevation at the top and the bottom is the proposed. Let's take a closer look. Um, this is the existing Orchard Supply hardware store. It's characterized by wood shingle, mansard roof, and a covered entry. This image shows um, the front facade on either side of the entryway. As you can see, there's a planting area along the front of the building, and the shopping carts are stored in front of the planters. Within the proposal, the applicant would like to remove the existing planters and utilize this area for a permanent outdoor display. The plans include a four feet of sidewalk in front of the display to maintain the ADA access. This image is the front elevation as proposed within the remodel. A new exposed beam truss will be installed over the entryway at the front of the building with new standing seam, a new standing seam metal roof. The existing stone veneer on both sides of the entryway will be replaced with stucco. The applicant added a three foot high wall to the left of the entryway for the store carts, shopping carts. Here is an image from their Millipedes store. In this image, you can see the truss system as well as the oversized metal post on either side of the truss. In the staff report, staff suggested that the proposed design is in compliance with the relative 41st Avenue design guidelines. Um, upon receiving the photos, I did become concerned with the scale of the proposed posts. They're approximately six feet wide. The 41st Avenue design guideline number seven states, buildings shall use design elements in public areas which provide a sense of human scale. Elements of pedestrian interest shall be included at the ground floor level. Uh, these large posts are out of scale with the truss system and is in, it is intended to hold up. The Planning Commission may want to consider limiting the size of the post to create a more human scale relative to the beams of the truss system. Now we will look at the south elevation of the building. The exterior of the smaller commercial tenants along the north and south of the structure will be freshly painted to create a uniform updated look throughout the entire multi-tenant building. 
The south elevation will be updated with a new 16-foot-high wrought iron fence, um, creating visibility into the nursery area and updating, as well as updating the trash enclosures. The applicant is requesting an exception for the 16-foot-high steel fence. The top image shows the garden center as it exists today. Within the new proposal, the new walls will be made of split-face CMU to match existing walls at the site. The walls will be painted to complement the building color scheme. A steel gate at the, as shown in the lower right-hand corner is proposed for the doors to the trash enclosures. The trash enclosures are shown um, as covered within the plans. To ensure that they are covered at the time of submittal, we recently we got these new plans in with the new fence extension above the trash. It's a stormwater requirement that the trash is covered, and to ensure that I would like to add a condition of approval um, to ensure that the trash enclosures remain covered within the modifications that were recently submitted. This image shows an example of the steel fence installed in another location. The high-end architectural fencing complements the building and is an inviting for the customers to look into and enter the nursery from the south side. This is an image of the back of the property facing 38th Avenue. The rear elevation, the only major change is the applicant plans to wrap the CMU wall and the 16-foot high steel fence around this elevation as well. This will add to the architectural detail as viewed from 38th Avenue. The planter beds will be spruced up with additional shrubs, perennials, and new mulch around the trees. The applicant is also requesting approval of two new sign, wall signs. The zoning code allows each wall sign to be no greater than one square foot of sign for each linear foot of business frontage. The front elevation is 150 linear feet. The proposed sign on the front elevation is six feet tall by 20 feet wide and approximately 110 square feet in size due to the curved edges. The nursery sign will be located on the south elevation. The south elevation is 165 feet in length. The proposed sign is 13 feet wide by four feet tall and approximately 54 square feet, also in compliance with the standard. Staff would, as I previously mentioned, like to add a condition of approval that at the time of building permit submittal, the garbage collection area shall be covered with a roof and a detail of the covered garbage collection area will be included in the plans. Also, um, this past week I was contacted by Roger Bernstein of Orchard Supply Hardware. Mr. Bernstein requested that condition number 11 be amended to allow the seasonal display area when the store is open rather than from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. as the condition suggested. The condition was based on the hours um, provided at the time, but he, he'd rather not have them tied to specific hours within the condition and, and should just allow it to occur what, when it is open. So um, staff recommends approval of application 15-067 as conditioned. Thank you. Questions of staff? So how does this uh, proposed display area relate to what's been going on there regularly uh, in the parking area on almost every weekend? So the proposed display area would bring it into compliance and would have an official approval with conditions that we can enforce. We've done quite a bit of code enforcement over, I've been here almost two years and have been out several times and written letters. Okay. So this will, when they brought in the application, we ask them to so what if I'm understanding I mean this has been a big issue uh, to some people is that, that it, it kind of it changes kind of the character of the shopping area there when there's a kind of uh, unsightly outdoor display area ev almost every weekend and you're telling me that that's been in out of compliance and that now we're going to have some specific conditions and they're only going to have outdoor display uh, in conformity with those conditions? That is that's what the is hope? that's the hope. And I'd, I'd like, I think the applicant can speak to that as well. Any other questions of staff? Um, this is the time for the public. Is the applicant here? Welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Does this work? Yeah, okay. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Nicholas De Torres. I am the I am the uh, applicant on behalf of Orchard Supply Hardware. Um, Miss uh, Catan here made a nice presentation as to the scope of our proposed remodel project. Um, we are excited about this whole uh, remodel as well. We think it's going to brighten up the shopping center quite a bit. Uh, we think it, it'll be good for the surrounding community as well, and we hope that the Planning Commission agrees with us. Um, can I, can any questions? Can I ask a question, please? Um, we, we got the revised plan, yes, uh, yes. and the one I got was so small I couldn't read. So for the area that you're proposing to use for the shopping carts, yeah. how many shopping carts will fit in that space? There should, be about, there should be about 50 to 60 shopping carts that can fit within that space. Okay, so, so how wide is it? I mean, how it's big is it? It's basically going to be three feet wide by about 15 feet long. So 15 yeah, feet yeah, long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if it was possible for it to be a little longer because mm. right now the, the shopping carts out there seem to be a bit unsightly in my mind. And I think like Knob Hill did a mm. great job in closing their shopping cart area as have some, some other spaces. And I'm just a little concerned that um, you know, it, it, it might be too small. It seems like if, you know, you could extend it another five feet so it would be closer to 20 feet long. Yeah, when we had um, originally discussed this detail with uh, Ms. Catan here, we were thinking some place between 10 to maybe 20 feet in length, so five feet I don't think would be would be an issue. Because um, I we think would that would just, just give a little more space mm -hmm. for make certain that there's yeah because the, there's no other place for the carts to go uh, if they're not in there there's not room um, on the side we right do in, on the site plan that you showed previously there is a space in the actual parking lot in that green area right. but um, that's towards gonna, the top that's going to go away when you're using it for outdoor display is there's, what was indicated there's going to be a portion of it that will still have a shopping cart corral in so the rest of it y um, y uh, yes it will be used for outdoor display but there in the upper right uh, corner it will be a shopping cart corral as well I mean, I'm wondering, would it would it be possible to sort of move the outdoor display down a little bit so that shopping cart? I mean, there's nothing worse sure. than getting out there in your car and having a cart and nowhere to put it, mm -hmm. and then you know they end up stacked all the way around. So um, it would seem to me it might make some sense to keep that shopping cart corral open for people to use. Am I the only one who is worried about the shopping cart? <laughs> no. I do have a question. I had sure. heard that there might be an, an additional shopping cart um, storage area inside the store when the remodel is finished? Yeah, they will have an additional um, cart storage area in the front right behind the main uh, entrance. So okay. that cart corral will hold between 20 to 30 c carts on the inside too. Thus, okay. it will offset the overflow on the site okay. and in front of the building okay. as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good. Other questions? So yeah. I'm going to follow up on sure, you heard my comments uh, yeah. to staff. So tell me from uh, Orchard's standpoint, what's been going on there? Why have you been having uh, merchandise all over the place? And how do we know you're not going to continue doing that? Well, um, this is one of many orchard remodels that have been taking place within the past 12, uh, 12, uh, 12 months throughout the Bay Area. Um, we have we have about a dozen, if not more, locations along the peninsula and the in the uh, East Bay, and um, you know a lot of jurisdictions are asking us to um, conform to this because, you know, all this time, you know, that's what's been taking place. Is there a so. different uh, regime in place right now? Um, well, store planning is store planning. No, no, and I mean, yeah, but I mean, is it the same basic ownership structure? 
Um, I would say so, uh, but but the the store planning team that we have behind all of these sites, I mean, they're very aware of of you know the outdoor display restrictions that a lot of jurisdictions, both here and in the sur in in the uh, surrounding areas, um, you know, are concerned about. So, yeah. Other questions? I do. Yeah. I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so, for the uh, the in the blue, the the um, continuous outdoor displays. Yes. What will those be built-in shelving, or will it be something that's rolled in at night, or? Well, I believe one of the conditions of approval is saying that they have to be brought in after opera um, hours of operation. Right. That's mm -hmm. the good. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah, so, so so they'll be rolling racks. Are they will they be similar to the one? Do you is it, are plant materials going to be going on those? Absolutely. That's yeah. plant materials. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it'll look similar to the racks that you have now with plant materials on them. Or sure. Are you planning an upgrade of that or? Um, usually their outdoor displays. Um, they like to refer to them as uh, temporary displays because the merchant dice is all, always swap. Uh, swapped out with, from old to new, probably by the month. So um, there's always going to be something else there next time you visit the store. So right, I'm just talking about the actual display unit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that will always remain the same, won't it? I mean, Correct. that's not going to change. No, no, no. So no. Uh, there's no plans for that. What are the plans for that? Is what I'm asking. I mean, what will what will those look like? Um, they're going to reflect. Um, plants that are very similar to the uh, perimeter merchandise that's sold in the garden center also. So in a sense it's going to um, it's going to entice the customer that enters in at the front to you know visit the garden center that's at the back also. So yeah. Um, so can that's, all, that's uh, all the questions I have. So on, on the cut front columns, yeah. um, which is brought up by the planning staff, mm -hmm. I actually, um, those concern me too. I even came up with some visual aids. I went to um, Orchard Supplies websites, you and did. it seems okay. like you have done a few different things with those big front columns on, on different designs of different stores. Yeah, they've, they've ranged from about, you know, about six feet wide to eight feet wide, um, depending on the location. Um, we try not to go um, less than about five feet, just because um, this this entry design is very iconic, very similar to the McDonald's golden arches, if you will. So um, this is kind of the orchard trademark for a lot of the stores that they're trying to remodel in the surrounding areas. Yeah. yeah. Luckily in our 41st Avenue design guidelines it yeah. says we don't go along yeah. with sort of trademark buildings and okay. stores and I think that's been a, um, a valuable characteristic here in Capitola. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my only request, would, I mean my first request would be I, I simply think that they should be wood columns that go down so it looks like it's mm -hmm. part of the whole trust system and design there. Um, well, you know, if you couldn't do something like that, then something more in, you know, the uh, two to three foot range mm -hmm. would, would I would think, be much more in scale with okay. uh, sort of the, the design there and what we're talking about. Well, right now, as you can see on the photos here, um, the color of the wood truss is painted in the light gray tone, and that tone carries down through the columns on each side, too. Right, but so you, you do them in stone and a lot of other materials in different places, so it's not like this is the only design that can, um, can happen. I would and I've say got photo evidence of it, so <laughs> I know you do. I would say in other surrounding cities, um, we just finished a 
job up over in San City and Golita, mm-hmm. and also uh, Mountain View up n- 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 north also that had very similar finishes that you see here. So um, again, it's 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 the icon. Yeah. I so. mean, I I know I know that you do. You know, my, I guess my question is, and maybe someone else can help me, so it's not just me hanging mm-hmm. out here. Sure, sure. You know, I mean, <laughs> I. Yeah. Yeah. I'm do, glad to step in. I don't have a problem with the corrugated. I think if it went down to three feet, it would it would be in scale. I mean, you can look at the building; they do look pretty massive. And mm-hmm. I, actually, I don't understand why someone would want sure. two massive roadblocks in mm-hmm. front of their store. I to got me, more over here. The more you can Here's see in a store, the better. Sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's not going to change a lot. I think three nice feet's not going to change a lot, and and I, I don't mind the corrugated. Smaller. Okay. What do you think? Uh, I, well, I agree. I'm not a big proponent of it being a <coughs> the width. I think it lends itself to um, putting posters and stuff like that up there, advertisement mm-hmm. type stuff. It lends itself to tagging it, and, and s- structurally it's not needed. I think it just kind of takes away from the design. So I would kind of concur with the rest of the commission here. <coughs> yeah, if, if I can mention one last item here. Um, You'll see in this um, sample here that the scale of the truss is relatively large. It, it's almost oversized, if you will. Okay, and um, a lot of the, um, for some jurisdictions, we we tend to say that well, if the scale of that piece is a bit oversized, also, then you know the scale of the columns you know it it might seem to be oversized but in the big picture with the overall facade it kind of goes with the scale too so well i actually went and visited a couple of your orchard stores and and i don't i don't think it's really in scale and my suggestion would be that um we let you work with our planning staff Mm -hmm. and we say something like they're no wider than three feet and then you and the planning staff can, you know, work out the details of how it's going to fit if other people agreed with that. Sure. How wide are they now in the plans? <clears throat> six feet wide? Okay. Right now they're six feet wide. So, yeah. So the sample that you're looking at here, that's actually eight feet wide. That's from our Milpita store. So six feet wide would be a l- would be as wide as what you're seeing they're like uh, 12 inches off on each side. I had a Go question, just three feet. a functional question, um, and it sounds like from what you're saying, there's no, there's no real functional use for them. They're not blocking um, in front of a door or no, anything. They're we just usually place them behind the walkways mm-hmm. so that customers with shopping carts can you know move by them without ha- having to go around them too and that's going to be the same idea for the Capitola location too we don't plan to impede on the walkways for access to the main entrance into the store either okay. so yeah I mean I think overall your new design is great I love the nursery and the angled door and I think it's great people are going to be able to enter yeah. I like the fence. I like the fact that you're improving the whole back of the store and that right. entrance yeah. along 38th Avenue. Thank you. You know, it's just overall, I think it's going to be a great improvement up there. Oh if yeah. You, those can only be three feet. Yeah. No. No. We we uh, we very much look forward to the to brightening up the existing shopping center to make it not only more inviting for you know the shopping center patrons themselves, but also like I said before, the surrounding community as well. So. Any other questions? I have one question. Sure. On the plans um, for the area that's going to be seasonal yeah. out in the parking lot, mm-hmm. it says on the plans that the final location is to be determined. Is it planned for that area where it's drawn on there, or y- have you guys really decided if it's you're going to move it within the parking lot? Um, the area that's currently shown on the site plan that uh, Ms. Catan had up earlier, that's that's going to be the approximate area for that outdoor okay. display. That's not going to change. Okay. You're if we want to shift it down a bit to avoid the cart corrals like you mentioned earlier, that's perfectly okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to... Um, speak on this item? If so, please come forward. Seeing none, um, who'd like to 
I'd like to start on, on another issue that we haven't really discussed. Thank you very much, Mr. De Torres. Uh, so I'm a business owner here in Capitol, and I feel like one of, the, one of my jobs here on the Planning Commission is to support business because it's, it's not only important to me as a business owner, but as a former council member, I watch the budget and I know that we are very reliant on 41st Avenue and our other business areas, and so I'm always pro-business. That being said, I'm always looking out for every kind of business and making sure, trying to make sure that everything is equal with all businesses. And I, I'm a little leery of, in fact, I'm, I'm against giving them uh, a, a the seasonal. I think against the wall, I, f I feel okay about. The seasonal, I feel we don't give to other people um, right now. And I do think we're going to be changing that in our ordinances. I do think outdoor displays are a thing of the future, and I do think we should have them. I think we can, um, we can write new ordin ordinances that make them look great and that will enhance all business districts. Maybe we have a different one for each type of business district. Now we don't have that for 41st Avenue. We've just had to tell Whole Foods to pull it back and, and make them uh, take away quite a bit of the stuff that they had out in front. And I'm, I'm concerned with fairness. I think, we, I think what we need to do with the seasonal display is ask them to do what we ask others to do with Christmas trees and things like that, and that is to come in for a special parking lot or seasonal display like the Christmas trees or whatever um, and do that for the next couple of years. Uh, you would get a permit for it. I'm sure it would be granted. And then when our codes are rewritten, then you would be designing that outdoor space to conform with our codes. Not only that, I would like to see that the, um, the two against the wall permanent displays would sunset in two years so that after we've written our codes, we can come back, review whether those still fit our current codes and our design guidelines, and then ask them to, it doesn't sound like it's going to be any permanent display, so you know you may have to make some changes at that time. Um, those, are the, those are the two things I'd really like to see. I'm very, very concerned that we give things to certain people because they ask for it or because they've been naughty and now they're going to be a little bit less naughty, or they're going to be naughty within the guidelines, and then the good guys who never uh, never do anything wrong, they're the ones who get penalized. So I'm, I'm hoping that the commission agrees with me. Right. So um, I'd ask a couple of questions. So like with Whole Foods, when it got approved, it got approved to have a certain amount of display outside um, the entry of the store. I don't think it had any, I don't think there was any approval for that. Do you remember? Well, there were for the tables on the south right, side. Right, right. I mean, because we, we now have a situation where, you know, it, it Knob Hill, they now have flowers and stuff out in front of Knob Hill. I mean, it seem, seems to be this growing trend. So, do, so does the um, drugstore in the Kings Plaza, and I think the... Uh, grocery store does it, and uh, Palace Art does it. You know, everybody's doing it. So I think for us to uh, allow one person, we just have to be aware that that changes what we're doing on 41st Avenue. So now we're going to ask each person to come in for the next two years and get get a, I don't know. I, it just seems to me to be muddying the waters at a time when we're going to be changing things anyway. And I think the solution for it is to ask them to do a permit the way we, we've done the others that we have, that we allow Christmas trees and things like that for the time being. Well, it, I mean, it is a tough one because, you know, having been here, um, spent years fighting with Orchard Supply about their, you know, outdoor displays, and it seemed to vary depending on who was the manager of the store at the time, whether or not they complied or didn't comply. And, I mean, I can remember having the thoughts myself, you know, what we need to do is come up with a system where people can get a conditional use permit and have outdoor seating or outdoor displays. And so, I, you know, I, when I saw it, I was happy to see that we were finally actually going to deal with this issue and they were going to have to get a permit and there were going to be some con 
conditions on it because um, uh, you know it, it it's hard to enforce all of these these little things that we say that we don't want and you know like the flowers in front of the uh, pharmacy in in Kings Plaza I mean I think they've been there for years um, uh, you know, I I was a little upset when I saw the red boxes going out in f on the sidewalks in front of buildings, and I was told they get conditional use permits for that. So I guess I'm I'm rambling a bit, but I I would like to see them get a permit for it because. So do you think we should ask it? the other merchants who are doing that on the 41st Avenue to come in for conditional uses during this two-year period of time? I mean, I think they should be able they should be allowed to have these, this, what they're asking for. I just think the mechanism should be more temporary until we get our guidelines together in a couple of years and then have them come back and meet the guidelines. I don't, I'm not saying they shouldn't do it. I'm just... So could we approve it for a two-year conditional permit? So a, a couple of comments. <laughs> From my perspective, I, I think the conditional use permit process would be perfectly appropriate to have a temporary seasonal type of use. You can condition it as part of the overall permit. And that's been the response we often give when we get the complaint with Whole Foods and, and others. If they start encroaching into their parking areas with outdoor displays, we tell them stop. If you really want to do it, you can come in and amend your conditional use permit. Typically, they're not interested in that and we have to enforce. Um, the parking lot sale is this weird, uncodified process that we have. It's not in the code. Um, our research that was that there was, I think, a council action minute where a council person said, we're going to have this process, but it never got into the code. So it's kind of this awkward process that I always cringe at when we use it because I don't think it's, it, it, it's not kosher. Right. Um, so, yeah. I have a question for staff. Under condition number 19, it says the applicant was granted a conditional use permit for the outdoor displays. It says was. I, is that something uh, on condition number 19? I believe that's uh, speaking as if the project were approved tonight, that that would be part of the uh, uh, um, use type that was permitted. Okay. That's so the new, this was the and thank you, that's very nice. That's the new conditional use permit enforcement clause that you're using. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. But can I, can I address this issue? Because yeah. the rest of the project I think is great. It's a yeah. big improvement in the nursery and all, and that's all real nice. I, it's, it's just this outdoor display thing that bothers me. First of all, I think it's, this is a completely different animal than the other examples you were giving. I mean, they, they basically take over the parking lot there, and stuff is strewn all over the place. And I mean, it's... Uh, it's just not what you want, uh, and it's not good for the future of the, the center there. Um, some jurisdictions, you can't come in for permits when you're that much in violation. I mean, you're just prohibited from seeking new permits because of that. And here, you know, we, we apparently are more lenient, so he comes in and then we're going to give him a permit, and then I, I'm not comfortable with where we're going to be at that point. And the conditions are pretty unclear and a little vague to me about where and when and uh, I mean it's I, I think we ought to be really tough on this and kind of do as little as we can and wait for the issue to be addressed in the new ordinance. So if we approve this without that conditional use permit they could come back in and apply for that separately when they were more clear about exact times and locations and how they were going to do it. Right, or they could just get a, a the, 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 the quasi-legal <laughs> permit. Yeah, our, our intent will be to create a new temporary use permit type in the code to address things like Christmas tree sales, pumpkin sales, and but other but temporary But you know, when we do the new ordinances and they're approved, hopefully we will have, you know, conditional use permits for, for you know, permanent outdoor uses because I think we all want that. Mm -hmm. Okay, TJ, no, you I'm, know? I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm right on track with you. I just, I, I'm happy to see that we're kind of some type of conformity and uh, I think that's one of the reasons we're here today, not just because of the, the remodel, but this whole conditional use permits has obviously been an issue at Orchard Supply for quite some time, so I'm glad that we're, we're addressing it. I could live with it uh, the way that you're recommending it. Good. Okay. So, are we ready to make a motion? I'm ready to hear a motion. If somebody okay. would like to <laughs> word it. 
There's a some, lot of uh, some somebody some people will have to help me with this yeah, one because I don't think I got everything. So I would <coughs> like to make a motion that we approve um, the. Um, tell me what we're approving, uh, the conditional use permit and the design, design. The design permit uh, and conditional use permit for the expansion of the nursery, uh, the exterior modifications, the exception for the 16-foot fence and the sign permit. Um, I would like to put a condition in there that if they want to have the um, outdoor display area that's in the parking lot, then they need to come back and either apply for a separate conditional use permit for that or apply for the temporary permits to do things like Christmas trees or pumpkins through the process that the city currently has. Um, I would like a condition that the uh, two posts uh, on the front be redesigned to be no wider than three feet and the applicant can work with the planning staff on the final design details for those posts. That the area for the storage of the parking carts be extended by five feet so that it's 20 feet in length. Uh, and that the trash enclosures um, be covered as required uh, by the storm management plan and any others? And if the commission agrees that the uh, permanent displays sunset in two years or upon our uh, the adoption of our new ordinances so How that about they can the adoption of our new ordinances so they can conform to those. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, so the seasonal display conditions need to come out then. Mm -hmm. Right. The seasonal display conditions need to come out because we're not approving. I, when I made, when I read it, I left out the outdoor sales part for in the parking lot. For clarifications for the, the sunset clause, did you say that it would sunset at the adoption of the ordinance, or I think they would need some time afterwards once the ordinance is adopted to bring into compliance? Would that be six months a year? Six months after okay. the ordinances have been adopted. Yeah, because, you know, it's likely that no one will catch it for another two years after that anyway, so. <laughs> but do you want them to sunset or just be more Whatever um, terminology defined? the staff feels is appropriate. Just so that it works with That it would form. terminate after the, six months after the new ordinances uh, are adopted. So they would a temporary have. permit. Temporary permanent display. <laughs> Nothing we'll is so permanent as a temporary government program. <laughs> <laughs> So then the conditions 11 would come out. Condition 11 we don't need to change the hours because that's the seasonal display but that's come the out. only one that is specific to the seasonal display and not the outdoor displays that we're allowing. Right. The outdoor displays in front of the store are there it's just the one that's in the parking lot that we're talking about. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimously approved. Good luck. Thank you very much. Okay, um, moving on to um, 809 Bay Avenue. This is a design permit and conditional use permit for a private outdoor seating area and on-site sale and consumption of beer and wine for the Knob Hill Grocery Store. Staff report, please. Good evening, commissioners. Before you is an application for a design permit and conditional use permit to allow for the sale <coughs> excuse me, of beer and wine in the outdoor dining area at Knob Hill. The subject property is located at the north end of Bay Avenue, adjacent to the SoCal Creek Corridor. The entire Capitola Center, outlined in blue, is zoned community commercial. The properties to the south are zoned single family residential and across Bay Avenue to the east of Knob Hill are commercial and office uses and a multifamily residential senior housing facility. This slide shows um, Knob Hill store as viewed from Bay Avenue. The proposed outdoor dining will occur under the overhang and trellis of the existing building. That red shading um, shows it. In 2004, the Planning Commission approved of a design permit and conditional use permit for an expansion and remodel to the existing Knob Hill store. 
As a part of that approval, an outdoor dining area was approved of as an outside quasi-public seating area, but never built. Knob Hill's 2015 proposal includes an interior remodel and outdoor dining area with beer and wine sales. Uh, the proposed outdoor dining area will have alcohol sales and thus making it a private, not quasi-public area. The private outdoor eating area requires a design permit for the modification to an existing CUP and design permit, as well as a conditional use permit for the sale of beer and wine. In addition, the applicant would need to obtain an entertainment permit from the police department prior to having any live entertainment, which would be subject to the police department standards. In addition, um, Knob Hill is currently in the process of obtaining a building permit for interior work, uh, which does not require planning commission approval. Knob Hill plans to remodel and refurnish most of the, mo much of the interior space, including turning the cafe area into a tap room. The proposed 1,561 square foot outdoor private dining area will contain a total of 14 tables and 40 chairs. The portion, or there is a portion of the outdoor dining area located under the existing building. You can see it shaded in blue. The remaining area is enclosed by a three foot tall metal gate outlined in purple. There are two proposed exterior openings in the gate on the eastern and western edges uh, that contain latches and self-closing hinges to ensure the gate remains shut. The outdoor seating area contains a portable stage in the center, shown in yellow. The applicant would like to have live amplified acoustic music here. The stage will be stored in the background during times, or in the back room during times with no live performances. Above the stage is a proposed TV highlighted in red. Knob Hill is also proposing to place six speakers around the outdoor seating area, creating a surround sound system. These are identified by those red stars. The applicant would like to have live amplified acoustic music from 12 to 10 p.m., seven days a week. The applicant has proposed to have a small portable stage where one to two performers max can provide live music and entertainment for the customers in the dining area. Music will be acoustic, but amplified by the surround sound system. Uh, the performances will be held to three hours in length or shorter. Um, like I said previously, an entertainment permit would need to be obtained by the police department or through the police department prior to having any live performances. Here's the proposed gate around the exterior of the outdoor dining area. The gate area at the exterior is required by the Alcohol Beverage Control Board. This is required so that alcohol beverage consumption is confined to a delineated area. Knob Hill is proposing to operate the outdoor dining area under the same areas as the grocery or under the same hours as the grocery store, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. There will be no waiters, and the drinks can only be consumed in the dining areas. For the food and non-alcoholic drinks, the plan is that customers will purchase items that are intended to be eated, eaten at the main register or checkout area and then must enter the dining area to eat the food. For coffee drinks, wine or beer, you're supposed to order at the counter or bar um, and then take your drink to any of the dining areas. There's a limit of one drink per customer per purchase and IDs are checked at this time. So planning staff and the police department had some concerns with the proposed hours of operation and the applicant's request to allow live amplified entertainment in the outdoor dining area. Although pr the proposed dining area is located within an existing commercial shopping center, the site is proximate to a senior living facility, a sleep center, and single family residences, which could be adversely impacted by the noise generated from this proposed use. Staff added an errata to this application, which were placed on your desks before this meeting. There's also some on the back table altering our recommendation to the Planning Commission. Staff recommends the Planning Commission limit the hours of operation of the dining area from 6 to 11 to 
8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday, as well as limiting the hours of alcohol consumption from 6 to 11 to 10 to 8, seven days a week. Additionally, staff recommends the Planning Commission limit the entertainment to acoustic music only and deny the use of the portable stage. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve application 50, 1574 minus the outdoor stage and live music proposal and with the hours for alcohol service being limited to 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. And um, there are three representatives from Knob Hill here if you guys have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Can you go back to the first slide and uh, to where you had the red shading, red shaded area? It looked like it was a little bit short of where it... Well, this was done in PowerPoint by me right before this, so it's, <laughs> it's hard to make it hard completely <laughs> accurate. <laughs> it does extend a little further out, yes. though. Yes, it does. And is, does it abut the uh, shopping cart, uh, uh, little pony wall for the shopping cart? Is that what it, it st where it stops? Well, we can. I can ask the applicant. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Nice PowerPoint, though. I like your. Uh, yeah, no, I did. I, I had a question. Go ahead. So I'm not seeing. You know, I think it's because I'm not reading them right. But I'm not seeing how someone walks from Bay Avenue to the grocery store once this is in place. There's still room around um, the outdoor dining area. It looks okay from that picture, but from the map, I mean, from the plans, it looks this, like they're in the street. Yeah. So, there you go. Yeah. The current gate right now, that white picket fence, runs along this line. It's at the very bottom, you see that? Yeah. And then right up here. Um, so there is several feet to walk around this way. So they have to have four feet. It does feet meet by the ADA. ADA. Sorry, it does meet the ADA standards. It does. I had the building department check that. There was a photograph that you had in the in the staff report um, that kind of showed that. Do you have any overheads of the photographs that were in the staff report? Where the big ball is, there's a um, sort of a. Yeah, I apologize, but that is not included in yeah, the PowerPoint. There it is. You can yeah, you can see the beach ball in this image, partially, but. And actually, that wave is a mosaic set in mosaic, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So so yeah. people do what? That's where we that's walk. Where you yeah. Are. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to ask how wide that is, but it appears to me to be you know more than five feet wide, at you know all all places there. So there'd be a minimum of five feet on the outside of the fence that's still inside the sidewalk area, right? I'm not sure on the specifics of the amount of feet. I just know it meets ADA standards. Okay. I believe it's a minimum of four around. Okay. Yeah, if you look at this picture, now down at the very bottom, you can see there's a, a dark line and it's delineated as the white picket fence. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the photograph, then you can see that white picket fence in the photograph. And we're going to be right where the white posts are uh, with the trellis area. So it's about 12 feet from that where we're going to put the fence to where the white picket fence is. And all that is walkable. So it's somewhere between 10 and 12 feet. Thank you. Other questions of staff? <coughs> Applicant, please. Well, we are uh, we're really excited to try to do this. This has been about... And state okay. your name, please. I'm sorry. My name is Mike Gates. I'm with Sacramento Design Systems. I'm speaking on behalf of Rayleigh's and Knob Hill. So, you know, this area has been out there for about 10 years and unused. And I think uh, it's, there's been a lot of discussion about how to use this. And, and finally, the, uh, Rayleigh's and the developer have come up with a plan that they think is going to work. And when there was a change with Pete's Coffee and some other things, it kind of precipitated this move. So now there's uh, the intent to try to use this area and try to make it a little more lively, bring the outside in a little bit um, to the area. Um, we are excited about doing it. We, we, we really believe that the music is part of the, the ambiance, and we understand the concerns, and we're okay with some of the hours, but to not have the live music, we think, is a, an issue for us. So we'd like the commission to at least consider 
maybe going against staff's recommendation and allowing the live music performances that we intend to have. Even if we have restricted hours, that would be great. Um, in terms of the alcohol service, uh, we would be okay with the hours of re restriction, but we would probably still serve alcohol inside but not outside it under those hours. So we would continue to serve al alcohol up until the 11 o'clock hour or when the store closes. So we'd like to consider that also. If, if we can make a recommendation, outside might stop at some cutoff, but inside could still continue. Because it seems like it's a noise issue more than anything um, with the staff's, re staff's issues. And we're here to answer any questions if you have any for us. Questions of the applicant? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just to let you know, we have the store director here and we have uh, two of the project managers that are doing other facilities. And just as a quick note, I just noticed today in the business report that I read that Taco Bell is now starting to look at applications for beer and wine in their stores also. So it's becoming, and, and Starbucks is, of course, doing theirs too. So it is kind of a trend that we're trying to capture. Well, a community just to our south just um, denied Taco Bell an application on uh, Tuesday night. Oh, they did? Not okay. for alcohol, for the whole Taco Bell. For the whole Taco Bell, yeah. Oh. Okay, well, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone from the public liking to speak on this item? Please come forward. Come on forward. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, hello. I, uh, my name is Kate Arietta. I live in Capitola. Um, I haven't had much time to study this, only sitting in the back. But I was looking at what the, the police recommended. Because my, I live on Center Street, and my concern is the noise. I like the police recommendations, alcohol, 10 to 8, only alcohol sales from 10 to 8. I have a problem with the television. No one else is thinking about televisions. Ah, good, thank you. <laughs> I have a problem with the television. Big problem. <laughs> I have a problem with the sound system. I don't want any sound system. I don't want acoustic guitar players bringing their own amps. I have a friend who plays guitar, and he has a nice little battery-powered amp. Okay, it doesn't have to hook up to anything. If somebody wants to have music there, I would appreciate it not amplified in any way, shape, or form. I don't think they need a stage. You got two people, okay. Sit them in a place where the stage would be and let them play. Uh, I was surprised. I like this gentleman's use of the word lively. I don't need to hear lively my entire life when I'm home. The other thing is, they say they're going to have like maybe two performances, four, four hours each. Does this mean like that would make eight hours worth of performances? We got this guy coming from, from uh, 10 to 2 and this guy coming from 3 to 8. I mean, that's two performances, even two performers at each time. So... Um, Please, please, please. And I was looking at this paper, and there's different, there's different times. One paper says performances 10 to 9. One paper says performances 10 to 8. One, one paper says performances till 11. I'm very, I'm very confused. But I like this idea, minus this outdoor stage, no amplified music, and if alcohol, 10. 10. I got to get up early and go have a drink at 10. <laughs> and I'll be there all day. Cool. Thank you. Please listen to the policeman. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Please come forward. Seeing none, we'll bring that back to the commission. Who wants to jump in? Come on, TJ. You, you start want me to jump in? All right. I do, I do uh, share some of the concerns that I was just spoken about obviously I, I wrote down this uh, sound system and the TV and then I question mark the need for a portable stage I um, I applaud the the idea of trying to look at how to better market that area it's always been one of those areas it's like almost closed down so I think it's a great opportunity for uh, 
for a release or not be able to do something, and I think it's a, a great concept. Um, I think for me, I could live with everything um, that we've discussed with uh, the police department's um, entertainment permit clause in there of uh, acoustic only, no amplified music. I don't think we need a TV. I mean, I could live with the portable stage if it was necessary, but I don't know why the need. It's a very small area there, so uh, I think they probably could get by with some um, just a, uh, acoustic music without it being amplified. Although it is sometimes hard to carry a conversation on at Pete's across the street because of the road noise. But um, I understand the concerns of the community, so I, I think it's a, a great concept, and uh, I could support it um, the way it was uh, presented by the police department. Well, I agree with TJ. I think that uh, I like the concept. Uh, I don't see a need for TV. I don't see a need for amplified music from, and having a sound system out there. Um, uh, and I like the idea of the outdoor consumption of the beer and wine ending at 8 p.m. Um, it's fine for it to go on inside in the store if that's what they want to do. Um, you know, I have the... Um, I live across from Shadowbrook Restaurant, and uh, you know what what some people think is a is pleasant music going on um, is not so pleasant if you happen to live in the neighborhood with them, and you don't get to choose when you can listen to it or not listen to it. So I think we should be very cautious about the music, and otherwise I like it. Well, first this is seems to me it's really consistent with uh, some of the themes in the general plan for this area which was looked at as one of the gateways to Capitola and to revitalize it and give it some life and this this is really I think terrific in that regard it kind of so would start to turn this a little bit into more of a community place uh, I can I wasn't sure what to make of the police department's uh, restrictions here but I mean this uh, uh, speaker kind of made it a little clearer that Center Street and some of those do have some concerns so there's a compromise that has to take place here. As far as the TV, tonight is a good example of why you would want a TV there because it doesn't even have to have the sound on but you've got to have on a night like tonight you've got to have the TV there. Well they can have a TV inside. Sports. They can have a TV, they can have a TV inside. They can have one inside they just don't need to have the one outside. Well, but a nice evening uh, with a big sports event on. I mean, don't you want to get home? Don't you want to agree with <laughs> the way the rest of us do? Well, it could not have the sound on. Too. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to happen. Well, sure, that happens in a lot of places. I mean, I, that would be a, a minimum to me. Is that the be seems to TV me they they sound. they could try their idea with no TV and. You know, they can always come for, back. For me, it's also a visual. It's not just the sound. It's that these are, you know, if this is a gateway and people are coming into Capitola, they're going to look over and they're going to see a TV going. Well, I mean, that's just tacky. That's antiquated, though, because the best restaurants now have the TV in their bar. Yeah. <laughs> but outside on the you, street, I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> come on, Ed. <laughs> Let's get this man home. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go watch basketball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gail. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm really adamantly, as, as a business owner on that a street, I am adamantly opposed to a TV. I really think they'll do a gangbuster business in a gorgeous location without a TV. And it, you can have a TV inside. You know, everybody with their beer later at night can have beer and watch TV, and it'll be great. Um, so no speakers, no stage, no TV. Follow the conditions that are uh, uh, lined out in the uh, errata 5C with uh, some omissions, right? We've got the addition of the operation, hours of operation that the police have stated, right, in this errata. These, these are the uh, Yeah, and then omission of the outdoor stage and amplified music proposal. Mm -hmm. And so we will uh, also add the no TV, no speakers, and uh, no stage. So that was a motion, right? That was my motion. <laughs> okay. I want to make a couple of comments before um, entertaining the motion and, and getting a second, and that is um, something that, that nobody's really talked about. That corner is a very um, complicated little corner, and 
I go in and out of there a lot, and you don't need anything distracting the motorists that are coming in and out of there. Um, we have uh, on the Pete side, you know, you're not supposed to pull out of that first lane and go left, mm -hmm. but people do it Especially all. <laughs> yeah, the smaller the car, the, you, you, I've seen several people who normally would not do such a thing do such a thing, including myself. Um, and to put a TV out there, or even to have a band, you're gonna—it's gonna cause a distraction. I think that's gonna turn into a, a safety um, issue. Um, I wish that alcohol and, and beverage didn't require a fence to delineate it, because I think it would be an awesome gathering place. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people gather at Pete's across the street. And to have amplified sound is going to disrupt that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to be sitting over having a cup of coffee, trying to, and people carry on meetings and have, you know, little conferences out there. And to have a band going on across the way, I think is, it's a conflict in usage. Not to mention the sleep center. <laughs> <laughs> the sleep center is way back there. You can't believe how sound travels. Really? I hear village uh, twilight concerts. Yeah, we hear the oh, yeah. other village twilight away. concerts at my house. Yeah. And I hear the end of the wharf at my house a lot. Um, I would, though, like to um, entertain the comment about having outside and inside. And I haven't had a chance to read the errata carefully enough. Do the conditions outline it so that inside can have service later than the outdoor? Or are they all, does it all stop with? So it all, s it all stops um, together. Okay. I will say that um, it says operating hours of the outdoor dining yeah. area. When I spoke with Rudy earlier, he was open to the idea of um, expanding that time limit if it was indoor, as long as they served food at the same time. Right. So, so that was another thing I was going to mention. If we, I think that it's clear that people can't buy a six-pack of beer and go sit and drink a six-pack of beer, but somehow we need to make sure that if they are, you know. Um, that there's some kind of food that they're buying at the same time that they're buying the, the alcohol. Otherwise, they can just keep going up to the, the bar and, you know, continue to drink oh, beer and wine. And we already have in this area issues with that kind of thing. So I'd like to see some somehow, if it's possible, to write a condition that says, you know, one, one drink per purchase, but food must be purchased at the same time. That will be the condition on the inside uh, building. Well, I permit, right? I mean, when they when they go for alcohol, yeah, I, th inside. I think we have to be a little careful because sometimes I do drink two glasses of wine, and you can, I mean, you can only buy one glass of wine when you walk up with your sandwich and you're halfway through your sandwich and you want a second but glass food of wine. Has been ordered. You ordered food. I don't think it means you have to order food every single. How do you monitor that? I don't know. How do you keep them indoors after they? If it's you can't. Okay, I'm sorry, but we can't. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, that's a management. That's a, that's a management thing. You know, that's we have to rely on the management to follow our conditions, and if our conditions aren't met, we go see we look them. at it again. Right. So what we're saying is that outside the area is going to close at eight o'clock, mm -hmm. but inside. There will still be wine and beer being served, and people can still eat in there. And it's saying 11 o'clock. This condition is saying 11 o'clock on the weekend, Friday and Saturday. So it's 8 to 9 on the weekdays, 8 to, eight 11, to 11 on, on the weekends. weekends. Sale, oh, a beer and wine for dining. That's, that's dining areas. So I'm sorry. It's, it is 10 to 8, 7 days a week for, for beer and wine outdoors. Right. So and I'm it does say it can reasonable. only occur with food. Right. Yeah. So we're okay. So it is okay. Yeah. So operational hours of the outdoor dining area are limited to 8 to 9 on weekdays, 8 to 11 on weekends. Sale of beer and wine for dining is limited to 10 to 8, seven days a week. So they can buy food and still sit outside and eat up to 11 o'clock on weekends, but they can't continue to buy beer and wine after 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. For the use outside. For the use outside. Um, that seems to me like it's just inviting an enforcement issue. Right. I'm, 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 I'm confused. So what we're saying is that um, I thought we were saying that the outside area, uh, there wasn't going to be any beer or wine or dining out there after 8 p.m. 
but that inside there could be beer and wine and dining that would go on um, during the regular store hours to 11 p.m. Did I miss? I, I think that makes it tough. I, I mean, so, sometimes we do get nice weather till you know later hours in the summer and nine o'clock is still light out. So I would hate to tie their hand. I I think the way that it's written that they stop the sale of alcohol at eight o'clock kind of prevents some of those trouble areas. And if you want to sit outside and and uh, eat until you know eleven o'clock on the eve on a weekend or nine o'clock on a weekday, I think that sounds reasonable. I don't know why that would. And I'd like to see it say 9 o'clock, seven days a week instead of 11 o'clock on weekends just because if you are, you know, a resident and you're, you're out that far, there's... Some people don't even go out till 9 o'clock at night to get something. I mean, on a weekend, not me. I mean, I'm always yeah. in bed before 9. But, but it's not like we're looking at a sports bar or a, you know, a, a main restaurant kind of a place. It's well, they're it sounds like they're making a tap. sounds like they're trying to... Yeah, I think we're, o we're over managing this personally. Yeah. I feel comfortable. I always feel I like comfortable the with the police department's recommendation. I think they've I got the experience with violations. They they know when how what types of uh, establishments have more violations and wh what don't. And I go with what they do. And I think we stay on it and make sure that they follow these conditions, especially, you know, in the first year. So leaving condition nine the way that it's stated in the errata. I don't think it's going to be a and, problem. And, and, and we, can, we can add a condition that says if, you know, we receive complaints about the operation, then the use permit can be brought back to the Planning Commission to review the hours. We could do the same with the speakers and the television. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start slow. <laughs> Television's a distraction. Now, I wouldn't have any problem if they wanted to have um, a little stage of stuff indoors. Would anybody agree with me on that? Or you know, we're not looking at that today. You know, yeah, they we're not talking about the indoors. Right. We're just talking about what's going to happen outdoors. The outdoors. Okay. So we we did have a motion, though, right? Do, do we have a motion? We did from oh, Gail. Yeah, we do have a motion. We make it again. Well, oh, easy for you to say. <laughs> I just want to know what we're voting on. All right. Uh, I am I am making a motion that we approve the conditions that were in the errata um, with the addition of no TV. We already have yeah, and no speakers and no stage. And I would make the motion that we we follow the advice of our chief of police on the hours. And I think we can add a condition about, we have before, I know we have added conditions having to do with, you know, if, if there is a noise problem, it can come back to us. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Well, we roll, oh. call. roll call. <laughs> roll call vote, please. <laughs> Commissioner Welch? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Ortiz? Aye. Commissioner Newman? In case they are going to go forward to the City Council, I want to express my no on this because I think their conditions are too restrictive. And Commissioner, oh, Chairperson Smith. Um, yes. All right. Then that passes. Um, that was the last item on our public hearings. Um, section this evening. Do we have a director's report? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, a brief report for you this evening. Uh, we do have a few events coming up in June that I'd like to make the public aware of and, and the Commission. Uh, June 15th, we're going to be holding a uh, community workshop for the non conforming multifamily uses and single family residential zones. Uh, we've sent out notices to folks within 300 feet um, of those use types, and uh, hopefully, we'll have good attendance and get some good community feedback on that. That meeting will be at 6 p.m. June 15th here in the council chambers, and so that's not the special planning commission meeting. It's not. Yeah, you guys are off the hook for that. Planning commission is certainly welcome to attend. I would caution though, if we have three or more of you, that we should probably, uh, you, know, you probably want to be an observer rather than an active participant, so we don't run afoul of the Brown Act. So we had a previously scheduled um, special meeting for June 15th. Correct, and we're going to use that date instead of the community okay, workshop. Okay, great. Thank okay. you. Give you a night off. Thank you. 
Uh, June 23rd, we have scheduled a community workshop for the Pacific Cove Civic Center redevelopment concept. Um, it's going to be at New Brighton Auditorium. Uh, the meeting's going to begin at 6 o'clock with an open house that will run for an hour. The formal part of the meeting will begin at 7 o'clock. We'll do a presentation, have some question and answer sessions as well. What day uh, is that? that one is June 23rd. Tuesday. Tuesday, thank you. That's the one our ad hoc group said. And that meeting will be televised, so if folks can't uh, make it to the meeting, we will record it. Will that also stream live on the website? It's my understanding that, okay. that we're going to be streaming it. And then finally, June 30th, uh, we have a public scoping meeting uh, as required by CEQA for the Monterey Park Skate Park proposal. Uh, that will also be held 6 p.m. here in the council chambers uh, to solicit public input on potential environmental effects of the project. And that's my report this evening. Thank you. Um, commission communications. I only wanted to let you know I won't be here for our regular meeting in August. And I have a question about um, Zelda's or someone's use of the breezeway. Um, it's been a c in continuous use for spare tables, chairs, garbage, all kinds of things. And I. You know, I know, I know we've brought it up to them, you know, and I'm not even sure it is Zelda's. It's just that it's between Zelda's and the kebab. The I think those are Mr. Kebab's tables. Whoever they are, I think that breezeway should remain Always open. Has Always, been. you know, remain open. Uh, nothing, nothing should requires. be stored there, right? Yeah, my understanding is they don't, they're not supposed to be storing anything there. Uh, the timing of your comment is, is uh, impeccable. We've actually been talking with both Mr. Kebabs and Zelda's about um, refinishing their trash enclosure uh, in front of the deck, um, doing a better job of scrubbing the sidewalk to get that in a more sightly appearance. Um, anecdotally, it turns out that the black marks on the sidewalk were as largely rubber because the wheels on the dumpster weren't turning, so they just were dragging it across <laughs> the sidewalk for the past couple of years. So um, they've agreed to do some more cleaning and, and, and some repairs there. So hopefully that condition fixes up and we'll reach out and remind them of the keeping the breezeway clear. Any other just, uh, just a reminder, there's a uh, big event, the car show down in Capitol this weekend. So we hope to see you all there. Yay. Okay, with that, then we will adjourn to the special planning commission meeting on June 22nd at 6 p.m. Um, and that will be a special meeting continuing with our um, zoning code update. Thank you. Great.